Hey everyone, Danger Dave, TCR, good to see you. Um, can you guys hear me? Hopefully you can hear me okay. My internet is a little... Uh, um, so I'll do what I can here. Uh, so I really dove into this subject. Um, I was having a, a short conversation with the Unsolved in his comments on his video today. And I had read previously uh, uh, about the pitfalls of ballistic science in general and um, really dove into it a lot today. And uh, I don't know if I've come out the other side any wiser about the subject. Um, but I, I, I guess... Um, Kind of my takeaway throughout the day was uh, really uh, when it comes down to a jury, um, th there's some problems there, right? Uh, they pick a jury on certain things. Uh, hey, Professor Pug, good to see you. And expert testimony, I, I have a feeling that expert testimony, you could find an expert to argue the point you want, I think. Hey, Lake, good to see you. <sighs> the thing is, it's really it really boils down to what the jury finds believable. So in my research, I saw a lot of defense lawyers, basically high crime, a lot of defense lawyers basically saying, um, you know, that it's junk science. And then a lot of prosecutors saying it is real science. And uh, what a strange position to be in now uh the unsolved uh showed me some documentation that since 1907 the atf uh the agency the alcohol tobacco and firearms um has been taking uh what's called tool mark forensics um such as extractors and uh, just anything that happens to a bullet as it comes in and out of a gun, right? They take it seriously. Now, back a hundred years ago, okay, guns were much more handmade. And so kind of my response was that, and something I had found in my research was that, Modern day uh, manufacturing is extremely precise and there really is, a, uh, there's much less handling. Um, so, but the tools to measure and look at, hi, Cindy. Well, welcome. Glad you're here. I, okay, Danger Dave says, in my opinion, the bullet will not have much to do with the jury. So prosecution will find an expert, or already has, that will say that the extraction patterns match. And the defense can find an expert who says that it is junk science. And we'll, get, we'll go into some of this. I'll show you some of the... the stuff um i'm just giving a summary basically hi polygraph um so there have been a lot of cases overturned because of ballistics being found to be questionable um and so a jury if all i'm saying is in delphi if this is all they have, which I sure hope not, uh, that's not enough. 
It's not going to be enough. Um, not even close. Um, so I don't have a SIG. Uh, I don't have the same gun, um, but I've got uh, a gun with a similar... Uh, this is the slide from a Walther P22, okay? Which is a much smaller gun, but as you can see, um, this is the, the front. You can't show a full gun on a live. And this is the extraction pin, which is extremely similar to the one on the gun, supposed. And uh, now I will say that on a clip, or on a magazine, sorry, that I noticed on my 10 millimeter, you do get uh, like striation patterns from when I loaded it into the magazine. There's actual cuts into the jacket here, which is interesting. So it might not only be dependent upon the bullet itself. And of course, this is a 22, but. Um, let me see if I can load this in. Well, anyway, when a bullet comes out of the barrel, which would be in here, and the back pressure gases pull the slide backwards, this extractor pin hooks on to the rim of the cartridge and ejects it out the side, right? So there will be... Let me use a bigger bullet so you can see it better. There will be a much larger, uh, on a 40, you know, um, there'll be a much larger imprint. Let me share. And I can kind of show you some better pictures here. Let me switch styles here there we go okay let me find this there we go this is uh firearmsid.com basically what i'm saying with the jury and experts this science is not perfect it's not a hundred percent they can statistically, especially with striations on a spent cartridge, this is an unspent cartridge, okay? They can get basically statistically to where they can prove uh, that it's the only gun in the world capable. But this, as we'll see, this is all of the science concerning ballistics has been challenged before. And so it comes down to the jury believing which expert is saying what to them, right? I mean, ultimately. Uh, but let's continue with this. These are firing pin impressions. These are breech marks. And then here we have ejector marks. And let me zoom so you guys can see this. Here's the ejector marks like we were, I was showing you with the the 10 millimeter bullet here. It will create a unique impression depending on the unique gun. Now, how exacting is that? That's what we're going to try to. It's not a hundred percent and Lipsha, you're right. Okay. Today or yesterday in the Alex Murdoch case, the judge rules crucial ballistics evidence is admissible. Okay, so here's a very recent case. And let's get to the point here. Um, prosecutors believe that these cartridges... Okay, well, let's just start at the top, because why not? During the hearings, Creighton Waters led prosecutor for the South Carolina Attorney General's Office and the State Grand Jury said the state has substantial evidence and expert witness testimony to prove that mechanical ejector and extractor markings from 300 blackout rifle cartridges found at the crime scene near Maggie Murdaugh's body. Body rifle cartridges found at a shooting range on the Murdaugh family property, Moselle and elsewhere on the property. 
Prosecutors believe that these cartridges may have been cycled through a rifle purchased by Murdaugh that is no longer accounted for, which his attorneys say had been stolen. This would be crucial evidence for the state and damning for the defense, and Murdaugh's legal team had previously filed a motion seeking to exclude it from evidence, stating that the science behind it isn't 100% conclusive, okay? This is why I was talking about it depends. It seems that defense attorneys support the uncertainty of the scientific validity of ballistics whereas prosecution is all about it right so pulling experts on both sides to testify is where it comes down because you're trying to convince a jury is really all that's happening and they will go through the scientific process what they did what it looks like the comparison and you're going to look at they'll look at pictures we will too and they'll compare and uh, but the fact that the doubt even exists and that a lot of time what it comes down to is the expert saying it is in my professional opinion that these match that worries me it's probably not a big deal in court of law um it is considered, I was looking at the different types of evidence. Um, we don't have to get into all of that, but, um, you know, <sighs> let's keep reading for a minute. The state put sled firearms ballistic expert Paul Greer, who is prepared to testify in the match. So it's, will the jury believe the credentials of the person presenting the information? Okay. I mean, ultimately, right. And during questioning Murdaugh attorney, Jim Griffin asked if he could say with scientific certainty that no other gun in the universe could have made these marks. Judge Newman ruled that not only was Greer to be considered an expert witness and the science he used credible, he was going to allow the ballistics evidence and testimony to be used in evidence. They can choose <laughs> jury members based on whatever they want. And that's something we have to understand also, which adds a weird thing to, to this, um, in my opinion. Like, look, as a uh, a person born and a citizen of the United States of America, in the court of law, we want everyone to have the best shot at real. Like I will show you in a little bit, like the innocence project. And there was junk science concerning um, lead analysis of bullets used by the FBI for a long time. That was later proven fake. And uh, they had to overturn like 165 cases, um, many of which were false confessions. Uh, it's really kind of scary sometimes. Okay, so here's a modern day just yesterday where they used similar evidence and allowed it in the trial. Here is uh, an article. This is this is one of the articles that the Unsolved sent to me. Um, it's basically, and if you go look in the comments on his newest video, you'll be able to see the the link. Um, identification of extractor marks on fired shells. So from 1939, they've been using this as a science for a long time. Okay. Uh, here is Oklahoma criminal It was just something I ran across. Um, <clears throat> and it's like, is ballistic evidence, forensic science or junk science? Um, and they're saying sometimes it feels this science is infallible, but this type of evidence is sometimes far from solid. Oh, let me, uh, 
Let me make this bigger. Sorry. You know, it's used a lot. It's used a lot to uh, encrypt, you know, to to solve cases, right? Um, here's in one court case, United States for Screen shows that while ballistics evidence may show similarities of markings, these similarities, like with fingerprint evidence, cannot concretely identify one specific weapon to the exclusion of every other firearm in the world. And like fingerprint analysis, determining how many points must match to identify a specific weapon with any confidence is almost impossible. So... I, I mean, I want to keep showing you just some more stuff so that we can be informed. Um, this is uh, a lawyer. Okay, so that already taints this article to an extent in one way or another. I, I don't know. Um, this is his argument for the problems with tool mark analysis on firearms. Um, and uh, yeah, odontology bite marks ended up being not necessarily real. Handwriting, hair comparison, latent fingerprint, lead bullet. A lot of those have been found to be completely unreliable. Um which is uh, crazy. Actually, hair follicle, they, they and uh, what was it? If threads, like uh, uh, clothing, even that stuff is extraordinarily debatable and considered junk science by a lot of people in, in the profession. Um, and the FBI actually got in a lot of trouble for uh, years and years of using some of this stuff to solve cases. And it doesn't mean it still doesn't close cases and get convictions, right? Because it does. It certainly does. Um, the people on the jury, they're, whether it's an ill-informed belief or lack of knowledge in a subject, that's all that really matters. People are being convinced on a jury whether someone is guilty or a reasonable doubt. And so it really comes down to opinion, which is tough because you want horrible people off the streets. And, uh, and I think even ballistics as a forensic science a lot of times like we saw in that article it comes down to opinion and not necessarily very hard science um so this this lawyer is talking about kind of the history of ballistics now, if there were more, if it had been fired and they had the spent shell casing and the bullet and there were firing pin marks, ejector marks, um, breech block traces, there were striations on the bullet from the barrel, that would add up to a much bigger, clearer picture. It just depends on how much they really have, right? Um, here's the picture I used on the thumbnail. Um, there's stria stri AI, <laughs> stri striations. So bullet goes through the barrel. I don't have a barrel handy. Yeah, and so here, here's that argument I was talking about earlier. 
There are many issues with this method of analysis, and in particular, its interpretation. This is not the 19th century. Firearms are now mass-produced, thus eliminating much of the uniqueness of a gun that came from being built by hand back then. There is very little hand filing, if ever, these days. The firearms are made using cutting tools made of high-speed steel or carbide, such as the below. Modern cutting tools do not wear anywhere near as rapidly as they once did. They are very rugged as they are constructed or coated with cobalt or titanium nitride, which is added to HSS tools to increase hardness. Titanium carbon nitride is added to HSS or carbide tools to increase hardness and prevent metal from adhering to the tool. Okay, so breaking it down, basically the tools used to cut and mold and form modern guns and manufacture have very high tolerances and very few unique features. So guns today really could have the same marks. Now they'll wear over time, right? So they might wear differently. So this extractor has had a few thousand bullets through it. Um, and it probably has a unique, so it depends on the age of the gun, uh, many factors. I know we just want to trust things, uh, when law enforcement says things, but, um, uh, I don't know if one of us was accused of murder, you would want, you know, You'd want the hardest science possible informing the jury looking to potentially end your life. So, I don't know. It's fa It fascinates me. I don't have the answers. I don't know. I realize they have scanning electron microscopes these days. They have, uh, actually, uh, let's see, some of this. Um, I was looking at one. Yeah, see, here, well, here's... Oops. I worry that the articles I've chosen are all biased towards m my stance, but I, I'm, I don't think so. I'm just saying there's evidence out there that maybe it isn't such an exacting science. And that in the case of Richard Allen, I sure hope they have a lot more or something like DNA in a place it shouldn't be uh, video or something clear video, I guess. So here's a Fox 59 article. Say what you might about Fox 59 by the Steve Brown, the chief investigator. You know, that's the funny thing is we... it often comes down to the integrity of the person telling us the information of whether we believe something or not. And even then we may disregard if we want to match our own confirmation bias, um, which is always a battle that we have as humans. But yeah, this is not a settled science. Tanya Brief, a senior staff attorney with the Innocence Project, is talking about a type of commonly used forensic examination accepted by law enforcement and courts for decades, tool mark analysis. It is how the Indiana State Police Laboratory says it confirmed an unfired 40 caliber cartridge ejected out of a handgun of Richard Allen. The unfired round was found between the bodies of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, is the only piece of publicly disclosed evidence linking the accused killer to the crime scene. In the probable cause affidavit used to charge Allen with two counts of murder, it is stated as fact an unspent 40 caliber round between the bodies of victim one and victim two was forensically determined to have been cycled through Richard Allen's six hour model P226. Um, some more depth on that will come out in the trial, of course. But as of right now, we don't know the validity of who did it. Uh, actually, what's funny 
Indiana just ended a job opening in Allen County for a forensic ballistics uh, uh, analyst. And you didn't have to have any experience. They would train you. Okay. That is very interesting to me, but whatever. That's beside the point. To understand how much how such a match is determined, we talked with Chris Monturo, who has 26 years of experience in a forensic consulting and testing company in the Cincinnati area. Monturo explained, while ammunition is generally made of soft metals like brass, copper, and lead, firearms have made of much harder metals. The extractor is steel, the ejector is steel. Those are going to scratch that cartridge case as it gets thrown out of the gun. He added, when you dive deep and look deep into the marks, microscopically, they will be different from gun to gun. That's the theory, right? I, I mean, it makes sense. Okay. Fox 59 Investigates asked how confident he was that he could match a cartridge to a specific gun. Monturo responded that he's absolutely confident because of his training and experience. There are lots of studies which back up Monturo's certainty. A spokesperson for the U.S. Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms pointed us to several, including one published this year in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. In it, a trio of Federal Bureau of Investigative Sciences gave 172 certified tool mark examiners cartridges and guns and asked them to look for matches. The reported instance of false positive errors where a cartridge and a gun were incorrectly matched was 0.933%. So less than 1% was incorrect. That's pretty good. I would say that is very sound. But they're using striations on a spent cartridge. Okay. T certified tool mark examiners, cartridges, and guns. But Brief said research backing tool mark analysis is flawed. The problem is that you can have a million studies that purport to show something, but if those studies are not properly designed, they're not meaningful. The Innocence Project, along with an array of university scientists, point to issues with research supporting tool mark analysis. They include small sample sizes, standards set by tool mark examiners themselves, and often studies are financed by law enforcement agencies that benefit from positive tool mark matches. Monturo flatly denies tool mark examiners are under pressure to produce cartridge gun matches. My findings are my findings, quite frankly. I get paid the same whether it IDs the gun or not. Okay, but the Innocence Project is pressing on against tool mark evidence. During its 30 years of existence, it has used DNA to exonerate 375 people who were wrongfully convicted. An examination found flawed forensic evidence played a role in 51% of those erroneous convictions. The question for courts is whether or not the science is current and reliable, said Brief. An example of that effort is an appeal underway in Maryland of the murder conviction of Kobina Ibo Abroqua, I butchered that, I'm sorry. 13 university professors are challenging the testimony of a tool mark examiner that linked bullets found in the murder victim to Abroqua's gun. The filed brief states studies supporting the analysis are well below thresholds of scientific validity. This dispute looks likely to play out in the upcoming Allen murder trial. In a press release last week, Allen's attorney dismissed the prosecution's theory of a single magic bullet said to be matched their client's handgun. The release goes on to state, it is safe to say that the discipline of tool mark identification is anything but a science. Out of respect for the gag order in place, Fox 59 investigates, did email Allen's attorneys in the state, Indiana State Police, not for comment, but to inform them this story was about to be posted. So a friend of mine brought up an interesting question. She said, how is a bullet the smoking gun of the case in a murder that doesn't involve a shooting? And I want you all to take that home with you. And that's your homework assignment. 
Think about that. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it does. Um, but it kind of blew my mind. And, and I think she's, she's on to something there. Um, so let me see what you guys are saying. Uh, I, I, I had a couple other things. Um, there's some scientific stuff. You know, it's not hard to, to Google some of this. Here's the Innocence Project. Let me see. I had a... Let's just look at this. All right. Misapplication of forensic science contributed to 50 52% of wrongful convictions in innocent projects cases. Good Lord, that was a mouthful. False or misleading forensic evidence was a contributing factor in 24% 24, 24 of all wrongful convictions nationally. Yikes. Okay. All right. This stuff is good. I want to open up dialogue and discussion about this. It's like, we want justice for these families. Uh, you know, they'll never be true justice, but we want real justice in the courts as some kind of uh, closure of some kind. Okay. Um, I see. Hi, Lynette. Good to see you, Sandra. Lynette is talking to someone else and saying, um, you know, planting a bullet. Okay. But that, th th that gun is extremely expensive, okay? It's a $2,000 gun. My uh, Rock Island Armory uh, 1911 10 millimeter um, was like $600. My Walther P22 is, you know, like, I think they're like 300 these days. I only, they were only like 250 or something when I bought it years ago. I have, I have some 700 and all my guns are basically uh, sub a thousand dollars. And uh, when you buy a two thousand dollar gun, um, the thing is, but you buy it for reliability, for everyday carry as a police officer or something like that, and then some enthusiasts do too. Whatever. It's a common police gun. Um, I I don't know. I I uh, I worry about this case. Um, you know, we just uh, we're just gonna have to see. We're just gonna have to see what happens. And. Uh, <laughs> it frustrates me to no end. I have a million things rattling around in my head. And tomorrow night on uh, Kristen behind the crime door, I'm going to go and share some of my rattlings with you. Discuss it with Kristen. But tonight I wanted to do this. Um, you don't. Oh, Lynette. Yes, you do. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm a, I, I'm an Indiana boy on an Indiana night and we all own lots of guns and I don't hunt. Uh, I've never shot anybody. I never will. Hopefully. Um, I, it, they are fun. They're a lot of fun. I, uh, at my father-in-law's house. Um, 
and my in-laws, but I bought my father-in-law as a birthday present last year, uh, a really nice hanging steel target. And it's one of the most fun things. My son and I go out there and we, we shoot and we, you know, with my father-in-law and uh, he's got black powder and we've got shotguns of all kinds. And it's, it's just fun. I recommend everybody do it, go to a shooting range. Uh, it's an experience you should have. Um, I especially suggest women buy and own a gun and carry them. But um, yeah, I, it, it's just a thing here in Indiana. Everybody, uh, I always have one on me, always. It's just in my pocket, always is. And I would say 90% of people in Indiana, that's the case also. Uh, clay pigeons are a lot of fun. Tin cans, yeah. Uh, one gallon jugs filled with water and they explode or whatever. Um, so it's like, well, we'll discuss. Well, we'll discuss a little bit tonight. Why not? I can change my mind anytime I want. Richard Allen, if he had a knife and a gun, that's not abnormal to just carry. Like, uh, I carry, it's called a CEO. So I always have a gun in my pocket and my CEO knife on me. It's not abnormal. You know what I do with this? I clean my fingernails and I cut Amazon boxes open. Kind of gross. I'm sorry, but that's, that's the truth. And, uh, it's it's not abnormal to see dudes walking around Walmart with a giant gun on their hip uh, and a big old hunting knife hanging from their belt and blah, blah, blah. So I, I don't know if he had a kill kit on him or something, um, a rape kit, you know, like a, a mask and um restraints things like that like uh yes responsive yeah guns are dangerous they are they can kill uh and so you have to be very careful and responsible i keep mine unloaded i've got safes um but i also have one in my pocket loaded <laughs> but anyway uh, it just depends. You know what I mean? Like, you got to be responsible. Whatever. Buy one. Learn safety. Learn to shoot it. Take some classes. And, uh, yeah, that's I recommend it. Uh, but, back to this. Let me see what you guys were saying while I was babbling nonstop. Thank you for coming. It's, you know, it's been a long time since I've gone live. Just busy with life. I'm studying for uh, some cybersecurity certification uh, for my job and wife and kids and uh, mother in law and just busy. It's not it a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Discuss that. Justice Angel, good to see you. I don't want to miss any of you. Okay, gonna jump out of here. <laughs> Wolfie, great name. The bullet. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna put this on the screen. That would add to things to me. So if the bullet they found matched a box of ammo he had at his house that absolutely bumps up the credibility, right? Absolutely. And uh, if it was an old box, even a new box, and they only sold it at a certain store and they can find them on tape or something, you know, the more they can add to it, the better, the better it will be for certain. That was a very great point. I, I even remember vaguely 
cases that were solved where someone used uh, an old, old ammo that was pretty rare at the time. And they, their suspect had a box of it in their house. They were able to search. They found the weapon and were able to match the striations. And so all that together was a much more solid case. Okay, so something that was discussed at one point was that firing pins would be manufactured with a serial number on the end of them that would stamp it into the bullet, right? Uh, into the primary. The primary is what uh, the firing pin strikes. This is a center strike cartridge, uh, 10 mil, and it hits that primary. The primary is what ignites the rest of the gunpowder and causes it to go off. Um, I don't know if that was ever passed, uh, but there was supposed to be a point where all guns moving forward, the firing pin would leave a serial number. So... It'd be interesting to, to find out. Yeah, I hope DNA, they found either the victims or his DNA in a place where it would should never be, right? Any speculation of how the bullet that was dropped there? So. <laughs> let's go with the simplest answer. Um, I think it's entirely possible that. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can do this. If you can hear this, let me double check my 10 mil. Okay, you heard that, probably. Let me do it again closer to the mic. That's the slide sliding on my 1911 uh, 10 millimeter. 10 millimeter is the caliber, which is um, one millimeter larger than a nine millimeter. Now, you can decock a lot of guns. That was the clicking of, of me pulling the trigger. So I can't imagine this would be... I'm holding this right next to the microphone. Okay. On the SIG, you actually can cock the hammer back. That's the sound you just heard from my 10 millimeter. Okay. Um. And on a SIG, you can do the same, which is ridiculous. And it's what you would do in a movie. In, in real life, you would rack the slide. You wouldn't cock the hammer bang. So say um, he wanted to intimidate at the crime scene after they had crossed the creek and things. They weren't being compliant or something like that. And he racked the slide again like it was a movie and it ejected a bullet, an unspent round. And then there's a lot of leaves and top cover. So that bullet could easily go missing. I will, uh, I'll be firing out at my father-in-law's and you'll get like a, 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 a dead bullet or, or something or a, or a stove pipe or blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it, it won't load correctly or whatever. And you, you rack it again and it falls out and then you never see it again because it fell under a leaf or, or so my thought is maybe he even spent so much time out there because he was looking for that bullet, maybe even moved them around because he couldn't find the bullet. Right. Maybe it wasn't staging necessarily. Now, that would exclude all the odd things out there. But I'm just saying, 
Maybe that's as simple as it is for why they were moved is he couldn't find the bullet and it was right between found right between the girls. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now speculation otherwise of how that bullet, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, It would be pretty fantastical for it to have gotten there any other way. Right. Once you start saying, oh, somebody took it from him and put it out at the crime scene, I'm like, nope, I don't think so. I mean, it's not impossible, right? But come on, the likelihood of that is pretty crazy. Does this. seemed planted there i mean it's not impossible okay it really isn't but a little weird tell him drop it someone else drop it yeah you know what if he was working with somebody else um could have been i would he roll over on his accomplice or accomplices for a better deal Think about it. The first person that squeals gets the better deal. That's always how it is. Why has he maintained his innocence all this time and not turned anybody in? I don't know. This is a very strange case, uh, and we have to really just be patient, right? Yeah, I mean, it would be easy except the extraction marks oh i did want to point out also on on my uh, magazine for my 10 mil if you let's see if we can see this when i put the bullet in the magazine it actually creates scratches on the case so there's kind of multiple avenues and those would be unique to like, maybe this got squished while loading into my gun. Maybe it got dropped on the ground. Maybe the coating had rubbed off, maybe different things. Um, I, I don't know. These are all things we have to think about when we're trying to judge this science. I, Yeah, I don't think Alan would put his own bullet there. Uh, That's what I think is most probable. I'm not saying the other possibilities aren't possible. Strong evidence, but not... (sighs) Kinda. There's still room for reasonable doubt, I think. And yeah... Totally. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Hey, Sandra. Good to see you. Yeah. I don't know. It was like an hour and a half. If if the muddy and bloody at three fifty seven is accurate, that's plenty of time. Ah, thank you so much, Wolfie. Appreciate you being here. Your good input. Mindy, hello. Welcome. Sell them to Ellie at a discounted rate. Sometimes give them to officers free of charge. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty normal. I mean, it, they better not, Lynette. Thank you, Danger. So, uh, open carry. Hi, Lynn. Open carry is when you just have it on your hip and everyone can see it. And concealed carry is when you have it in your pocket. So I have, I've had a concealed carry permit for 15 years. And, but last year, Indiana decided you don't need that. It's unconstitutional or something like that. So anyone without a felony is allowed to carry a gun open or concealed now in Indiana. Ah, Captain. He actually tried to call me just a few minutes ago. I guess he's not watching my live. That's all right. <laughs> so to recap, it's my, my hypothesis that it seemed... I don't want to say hypothesis. It seems that when it's the prosecution, the science is 100%. When it's the defense, it's questionable. But also the Innocence Project, which does really good work and has helped like save people's lives from prison and whatnot. Um, and when it comes down to it, it's going to be the jury that's selected and who they believe in the testimony of expert, uh, you know, expert testimony. Sorry. Um, hi, RNM. Thank you so much for coming. Friend I mentioned earlier. Uh, do your and everybody. I gave everybody homework based on something RNM said to me. So scroll back and you can see that too. Um, I I I don't know. So we're gonna have to see, and it should be interesting. Um, I wish I had a strong yes or no. Is it junk science? <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know. Hi, Incog. That's the best time to listen to me while doing dishes. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. I'm doing great. Thank you. Just been busy with life and frustrated with the Delphi case uh, just because, you know, I mean, there's nothing really new. I don't, you know, there's so many other great channels that cover the little tiny things. And sometimes when I, I, I like to do episodes when I think I can add some good discussion. So that's kind of my thing. Um, can you statistically prove a spent bullet? Um, yes, I, I think so much more than an un you know, I, I just think there's more because there's more tooling marks, right? There would be the firing pin, the extractor, the striations, and then the 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 marks from entering the barrel as well, along with gunshot residue, uh, along with uh, if they can recover the gun, blah, blah, blah. Like the more you can add on, like a single mark on a bullet, nah, I'm sorry, probably, probably isn't good enough, but the more you can add to the evidence to corroborate, I think the better chance of it being better science overall. 
It's like a Western movie. <laughs> it's always a surprise. I think this trial is going to drag out for a long time before we even actually get to a trial. Um, but they've, they've picked a jury or well, they've picked a County or kind of, I guess. So we'll see. And, uh, something, if I can add more in the future and I will, I'll bring it up. I'll discuss it. And we'll talk about it, but I will be on Kristen's tomorrow. So come check me out over there. You don't have to, but it'd be cool if you did. And, um, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the weird stuff. Like, I'll give you a hint. How does a man that tiny move around a 200-pound body? Absolutely baffles me. Okay. All of you, thank you, Meerkat. You, you rock. So, have a great night, everyone. Talk to you soon.